so hello everyone we'll just start in 2 minutes we'll just wait for everyone else to join in okay so in the last class we finished till the british occupation of whole of india starting from the uh, battle of plassey they conquered bengal and now they uh, captured the south and then they the last they captured punjab okay so what we have done is we have effectively one by one gone on to see that how uh, british expanded their um, horizons with uh, uh, conquering bengal first as a central state and then the rest as a buffer state to protect its core that is bengal we also in the last class studied about conquests that were beyond india now i am just telling you because we are having a hindsight bias in uh, seeing what are the neighboring regions of india because at that time there was no definition of what is or what was to constitute the india so we study about uh, what uh, happened why they captured bengal why they captured burma and how finally they captured afghanistan and then we move, move forward and see how they captured sind and i told you to remember uh, two to three treaties now the number one treaty was the treaty of yendabu the treaty of yendabu was signed between the burmese king and the british east india company then there was treaty of sugoli 1813 that was signed between the yes that was signed between if i can get an answer who signed uh, the treaty of sugoli was signed between which two countries and the treaty of sugoli was also in news uh, last year treaty of sugoli hello i just want to ask that between whom treaty of sugoli was signed the treaty of sugoli was signed between which two countries
Yes, it was signed between India and Nepal. That's the correct answer. So, uh, we did with everything else that is left there. Okay, we signed out at uh, the Treaty of uh, Mayawali, which was between the ruler of Sin and Sin was finally uh, be, uh, made to annexed and became under the Bem Bem Bombay Estate in 1847. Okay, so this uh, we did we did the conquest before. Just draw a picture of the map that as India stands today, what it looks like today, and uh, how it was how it impacted the uh, landscape at that region. In a way, Dalhousie created the if there's a question in the mains that who created the map of India or in a sense of writing a conclusion we can just write that it was the Lord Lousy who created the map of India as we see it today because he conquered um, he uh, conquered the regions and final the map of India that we see before the partition was made finally by Lord Dalhousie. Okay. So today what we are going to start is we are going to start the impacts. Now impacts also we will study in five phases. The first is the economical impact. The second is the political and administrative impact. The third is the judicial impact and the fourth one we will study about is the social reform movement that the British led and the Indian society how it changed. And the fifth and final we will read about the miscellaneous impacts like what impact the Britishers had in Indian education what impact the Britishers had in census, in development of different offices, of archaeology, of culture and of science. Okay, so these are the broad five parameters and, uh, under which we will study the impact. Now the first impact that we will study is the economical impact. I just want to ask that is Is it buffering? If you can hear my voice, just send a yes. And the video. Is it buffering? If it is buffering, you can send a yes so that it gets to me. Okay, so I'll start with the uh, economy. 
uh, what were the impacts of the Brits on the Indian economic system. Now I'll just uh, lead you to understand that what is the Indian economy at the eve of the arrival of the British. Now on the background of the eve of 18th century, Karl Marx describes India as a self-sufficient village community led and self-governing Indian style community led communism. Now this communism is self-sufficient because Indians had their own uh, way of cultivating, Indians had their own way of uh, trading, the barter trade that prevailed and Indians uh, had their own way of uh, giving revenues and taxes. Okay, But the very um, disfortunate or uh, something of a troublesome uh, thing that you can ask, that, that you can tell is that the royalty had enormous wealth, Mughals were among the richest nobles and more than 30% of GDP trade and business were done by the Mughals. Okay, uh, now there was a high level of inequality because the royalty had enormous wealth. The Mughals were the among the richest nobles and Indian uh, common folk didn't have that much money. But still the village was self-sufficient. There was there was famines and there was something of the natural sort but that was uh, done away with the help of the royals. Now craftsmanship and world renown and always you have to understand before the arrival of British the balance of trade had always been in the favour of India. It was only after when the Brits left the um, India from more than 30% GDP was left to 0.3% of the world trade GDP and the trade and business. Okay. Now what were the um, inherent problems? Now the inherent problems were the stagnant conditions, uh, the poor modernization and exorbitant revenue demands. Now what are this uh, okay so what were the problems the problems were the stagnant conditions poor modernization exorbitant revenue demands and instability graveyard of Mughals mad instability loot and plunder now you have to understand that though the Mughals uh, reached uh, lived a royal life but there were some inherent problems that had been prevailing first of all uh, as Irfan Abhi puts it uh, the decline of Mughal empire is always is also led to the decline in agriculture crisis the stagnant conditions poor modernization exorbitant revenue demands I already told you that uh, during the battle of uh, after uh, during the battle uh, when Aurangzeb was uh, conquering the Deccan there was so much uh, uh, exorbitant uh, when Aurangzeb was leading the battle at Deccan, uh, I told you that there was so much pressure that too much Jagirs, too much Jagirdars were chasing too few Jagirs. Okay, so there was exorbitant revenue demands, instability due to the loot and plunder of uh, Ahmad Shah Abdali and uh, the um, Nadir Shah. Okay, now disintegration of landholders, as you know, Jamindars were getting disintegrated continuous wars and agriculture crisis that led to drying of the treasury. These were some inherent problems when British came ashore and Farooq Siyar gave the golden farman 1717 to the British for trade. Now British arrival. Now you have to understand this under the heading that from the trade business to business of government. Now British arrived having their intention to being a trade. But then what they did was they institutionalized a sense of business which was called as a business of government. So what does the government do? A government provides services to its citizens. But when the then government took all your revenues and was sending back home, that becomes the business of government. Okay, what we have a government is we give our taxes, we give our revenues and in the end of it, we are the end beneficiary. Like they create roads, they create jobs and they think uh, infrastructure building. These are all public services that the government provides. But the business of government in a sense is a thing that uh, what you are doing is effectively having a long long term effect on the psyche of the common folk that all the money that from them are given back to England. Okay, there is no uh, harm doing or no governance in uh, back home in India. Okay, now EIC East India Company was a joint stock company. I already told you the name of the East India Company was Merchants Ad Adventurers. It was a joint stock company which was granted charter and monopoly by the Queen. The most important word here is monopoly. Monopoly in trade means you have the complete right to trade. You permit somebody to trade or you do not permit somebody to trade. Now this is very important because 
at the time of the churning of industrial revolution many prominent industrialists were emerging the new capitalists were emerging and the having monopoly in india in a rich state like india was a very big thing for the then um, house of uh, for the then east india companies merchant adventurous company now they uh, performed a policy which is known as the policy of buy cheap and sell dear due to special trade privileges i already told you what is buy cheap buy cheap is you cheaply buy something like the famous pashmina, pashmina shawls the silk the mullins of the bengal and then sell dear to special to due to special trade privileges because you have the monopoly plus you are given dastak which are uh, free trade passes which you can trade wherever across the india giving no taxes due to the battle of baksar okay now territorial expansion new source from trade to revenue because of lessee's fair policy now what happened after the charter act of 1813 the monopoly was abolished now in political and administrative uh, impacts we will study about one by one what were the charter acts so i'll just tell you in brief in 1813 the charter act of 1813 what it gradually did it ended the monopoly of the um, uh, East India Company. Why this was happening? Because of laissez-faire policy taken up by the then uh, yeah, British government, uh, the monopoly had to be abolished. Now, after this monopoly abolishment, new and new companies started entering into India from England, from Europe. So, what they did is they found a new source from trade. They become they became the master. They began to eye the revenues that would be generated. Okay. so these uh, economic depredation can be divided into three stages first one is a colonial state the colonial state is the when the entire uh, indian uh, map was turned into a colony of the british and then the third stage is the era of fiscal capitalism fiscal capitalism is uh, uh, i'll tell you that i told you the difference between what is the trade uh, where of and then revenue where of okay so uh, colonial stage is when they become the merchant then they get trade privileges and then they start setting up their businesses now era of fiscal capitalism if fiscal fiscal is related to budget we say fiscal policy of india now what is a fiscal policy of india fiscal policy of india is a fiscal policy that the government will follow okay so this fiscal capitalism means the work of the government is taken up by the company and the company serves its own master back home and gradually uh, some uh, sort of governance is given as a lieu of a carrot and stick policy okay so colonial stage is the era of merchant capitalism mercantilism period of monopoly of trade and plunder i told you the charter act of 1813 is a watershed moment where the monopoly of east india company is uh, done away with now era of trade come plunder go master system if you get a question in prelims for that say that what was the go master system you just have to answer this in a word way that the agents of british who were commissioned by the british for procurement of cloth that um, this go master system is the uh, artisan or the uh, the traders the trailers they cannot uh, sell without the uh, selling to a middleman that middleman was a britisher and this was the go master system that the native traders and capitals they have to sell it to a middleman that was british who would then export it to britain okay so because of illiteracy because of not knowing rates and because having free trade privilege in britain in india for the brits so the brits uh, they literally plundered and uh, the native traders and capital they were subordinated in a further way that they were completely eroded okay in a direct agency system now i told you about jagat seth how they were powerful and because of uh, jagat seth defection uh, uh, nawab suraj nawab suraj ud daula was defeated and in bengal uh, the british uh, won the battle of plassey now these were so powerful so to break their monopoly what the company did is the company started its own banking system okay so what they were doing is these jagat seths to lower the morale and to lower the importance of these in house bankers jagat seeds company started their own banking system what was diwani rights post now these diwani rights now i told you about battle of baksar 1764 now after this battle of baksar they were granted diwani rights of bengal bihar and odisha now this diwani rights was the first form of uh, any sort of revenue that the that the britishers 
were given okay so before this they were just getting trade privileges okay now after this they are getting the state revenues so what they did is they systematically drove everything and they found uh, um, a way to do the governance without doing the governance now this is the dual system of governance where the face of the administration was mir jafar was mir qasim but what happened is the financial rights that had uh, to start to sway with the britishers and they were using what is known as the drain of wealth theory which dada bhai noroji narrates in it in his book uh, the un british rule um, the un british rule in india okay he told he propounded a thesis which is known which is known as the drain of wealth theory transfer of funds used money for further territorial gains drain of wealth etc i told you for um, they used the war treasury to conquer deccan to conquer punjab to conquer afghanistan to conquer burma and everything else okay so khatbandi system the concept of indentured laborers indentured laborers now you might have come across uh, the west indies where so many indians live you might have come across a mauritius uh, mauritius has a prime minister which is having an indian origin i'm just saying indian origin from the parent side okay so what is this khatbandi system is the concept of indentured laborers this indentured laborers is a also a very important uh, i mean to say a very important issue in the recent assam elections because and also in uh, bengal elections in darjeeling because they were made to work in these tea gardens so they are these indentured laborers okay now import restrictions now if you have monopoly what you can do is you can have import restrictions erosion of ancestral occupation of artisans reduced to only raw cotton now what they are doing is having an industrial revolution back home in england okay so the industrial revolution what it wants it wants raw materials so what they do is they get raw materials from india and then they sell it to uh, back home and then finish good or sell again in the market so this was a vicious circle industrial revolution there is a famous quote by uh, shashi thurur that uh, some people say that india missed the bus of industrial revolution well uh, it was the brits who threw india under the bus so they didn't lose the bus to industrial revolution it was us who was sponsoring the industrial revolution in england okay so what is the era of industrial capitalism i told you free trade one way trade that is important one way trade one way trade relates to raw materials are sent to england finished goods are again sent back to india and they are sold the charter act of 1813 abolished monopoly one sided free trade chiefly in importer of goods okay turning into a colonial economy now what does this is what is this doing turning india into a colonial economy this is doing is what is um, uh, they are doing is deindustrialization and destruction of indigenous economy increased production of cash crops and westernization okay you know what is westernization there is a famous quote by lord macaulay while drafting uh, 1833 minutes education program he said that we want to create what is something of western indian okay an indian 